It was the fourth summer of the war, and U.S. Grant's overland campaign had sledgehammered its way down to Petersburg, Virginia. It had been a campaign that had bled both blue and gray armies white. There, east of town, under oppressive heat and humidity that walks hand in hand with the month of July, a daring plan unfolded, which, if successful, might end the war. Instead, it added to the slaughter. This is the story of an engineering marvel, a tunnel. This is the story of the Battle of the Crater. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. In early July 1864, two battered armies eyeballed one another. At some places, their lines barely 130 yards apart. U.S. Grant's overland campaign, which began back on May 4th, seemed a universe ago. Bloody battle at the Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, the North Anna, Cold Harbor, and now some 24 miles south of the Confederate capital, Richmond, at Petersburg. U.S. Grant wanted the town for its military value, for Petersburg was a back door to Richmond. It was also a vital commercial and supply hub for Lee, with rail links to not only Richmond, but Norfolk, Tennessee, and the Carolinas. Grant had chances to capture the town back in June but a series of botched attacks denied him. And so, he did what he did not want to do. Back on Monday, June 20th, he informed his generals, I have determined to try to envelop Petersburg. It was exactly what Robert E. Lee feared. Indeed, to another officer, the Confederate chieftain confessed a few weeks earlier, We must destroy this army of Grant's before he gets to the James River. If he gets there, it will become a siege, and then it will be a mere question of time. Before, there had been endless marching and fighting. Now there was endless digging, all under a blistering July sun. Both armies threw up far more than simple breastworks. They dug ditches with raised earthen parapets and fronted by the 19th century's equivalent of barbed wire, a batie. Branches of trees laid in a row with sharpened tops directed toward the enemy. And chevaux de frise, portable frames, usually logs with projecting wooden spikes or spears. Along both Union and Confederate lines, there were enclosed redans or forts, strong points for infantry or artillery. Additional trenches were added behind and parallel to forward lines, and all were connected with zigzagging communication trenches. Added to this maze, sunken roads, some covered, were built to move men, guns, and wagons from the rear to the front. Weapons were required to fit these new military conditions. Normal field artillery fired with a flat trajectory, and that was not effective against entrenched men. So both armies made extensive use of mortars. Their high flight patterns meant that lethal shells could drop into trenches filled with men. With them and large siege guns, shelling was constant. And because of that, sod and timber bomb proofs were built. And if all that was not enough, Mother Nature had her say. It had not rained since early June, and any activity produced choking clouds of red, talc-like, inches-deep dust. It was so dry that surface water was virtually gone, and that prompted more digging, for substrata of clay often held a ready supply of cool water. And so, in this hell on earth, hot, sweaty, Filthy, careworn men huddled in their trenches and made sure they stayed down for fear of a sniper's bullet. 
and frazzled they were from the constant thumping of big guns. All that may well explain why one man in the 48th Pennsylvania schemed. He was 31-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Henry Clay Pleasance, and before the war he had been a civil engineer. Then he had driven nearly a mile-long tunnel through the Alleghenies for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Here at Petersburg, it just so happened that the 400 men of the 48th had dug in a little further than others. They were only 130 yards from the Confederate line. Right across from them, on the crest of the next ridge, a southern redan which held Lieutenant Colonel William J. Pigram's artillery battery, and in entrenchments north and south of them, Brigadier General Stephen Elliott Jr.'s South Carolina Brigade. This section of Lee's line was known as Elliott's Salient, and it was critical, for 500 yards behind them, was the Jerusalem Plank Road, which ran north along another crest, and one-half mile from that position, Cemetery Hill, which dominated the surrounding terrain and the town of Petersburg itself. Elliot Salient had to be held. Back to Pleasance and his men. About 100 of them had been anthracite miners before the war, and had, in fact, done some digging earlier in the war. Pleasants wanted to make use of their talent again. With the Confederate line only 130 yards away, Pleasants wanted to run a tunnel from his line to the Confederate salient, fill it with black powder, and blow the Confederate position out of existence. Union troops would then storm through the resulting gap, get astride the Jerusalem Plank Road, move to Elevated Cemetery Hill, force Lee out of his lines, capture Petersburg, Richmond, and end the war in the Eastern Theater. His Ninth Corps commander, the luckless Major General Ambrose E. Burnside, approved the plan June 24th and promised support from Army headquarters. Despite his positive energy, neither U.S. Grant nor Army of the Potomac commander George G. Meade were enthused. Grant regarded the plan as nothing more than a means of keeping the men occupied, and Meade believed a mine at the proposed site would be in the wrong place. Adding to the negativity, Meade's chief engineer, Major James C. Duane, thought Pleasant's plan, as he put it, claptrap and nonsense, and avowed that such a length of mine had never been excavated in military operations and could not be. That last statement was true. The longest ever run had been during the siege of Lucknow in India, and to ventilate that tunnel properly, its distance could not exceed 400 feet. Regardless, Pleasance and his men prepared, and did so without necessary tools, planks, nails, or wheelbarrows from Army headquarters. Instead, they improvised. Hickory sticks were fastened to cracker boxes to make hand barrows, and army picks were made smaller and straightened for mining purposes. They rounded up extra picks and shovels from other units, and despite the lack of support, at high noon on Saturday, June the 25th, they began to dig. Some 210 men worked round the clock on three-hour shifts and averaged 23 feet a day. To keep the mine from collapsing, they needed stout timbers. Again, with no help from Army engineers, Pleasant's men raided an abandoned sawmill five miles to the rear and tore down an old bridge. They tunneled at a gentle incline to allow for drainage. Its height was, for the most part, four and a half feet high and varied in width from four feet at the bottom to about two at the top. While digging, Excavated debris was placed in buckets, and to escape the prying eyes of Confederate pickets, discreetly spread at the bottom of a ravine behind the Union works. Candles and lanterns provided illumination, and were attached to the walls every ten feet or so. All went well until Saturday, July 2nd, when the miner struck a layer of solid wet clay, which made the ceiling sag. Stouter timbering corrected that issue. Then a day or so later, another problem. 
They hit marl, a putty-like mixture of clay and calcium carbonate, which not long after exposed to air became rock hard. Unable to move forward, Pleasance and his mine bosses decided to turn the shaft upwards 7.7 degrees. That meant the shaft rose 13.5 feet over a horizontal distance of 100 feet. After tunneling 200 feet, four important issues loomed. First, the Confederates could not learn that a tunnel was being dug. In this case, Pleasants and the 48th Pennsylvania were lucky, for after only a few days of digging, only one Confederate was suspicious. That Southerner was Brigadier General E. Porter Alexander, who was the Army of Northern Virginia's Chief of Ordnance. He had noticed that firing from Union snipers had increased directly opposite Elliott's salient. As he put it, that indicated to me some operation was going on. By June the 30th, he later recalled, I became satisfied that the activity was underground. That same day, a Thursday, he was hit by sniper fire while returning from making observations. Despite it being only a hand wound, he was ordered home to Georgia to recuperate. But before he left, he reported his suspicions to Lee, who ordered countermining. That began Friday, July 15th, some 20 days after the Union mine had been started. Confederate countermines were dug on each side of Elliott Salient and two more at nearby Redan's. After every 15 minutes, Southern miners were ordered to stop and listen for the sound of digging. If any mining was discovered, a charge was to be placed and detonated, which hopefully would cave in the Union attempt. Though the two at Elliott Salient were close, the work of the 48th Pennsylvania was not discovered. Other Confederate countermeasures were taken. A series of southern batteries were placed, which covered the rear of the salient, and another defensive line, elevated above Pigram's Redan, was dug behind the main line. Meanwhile, for Pleasant's three more issues, the length of the shaft, ventilation for his miners, and finally, where would the gunpowder be placed? To calculate the shaft's exact length, Pleasance made the use of a surveying device, a theodolite, which was a high-precision transit used for measuring angles. It was essentially a mounted telescope that could be rotated horizontally and vertically to measure horizontal and vertical angles. Major Duane, Meade's chief engineer, promised one, but when it didn't show up, Pleasance borrowed one from a friend of a friend in Washington City. To make his measurements, he had to expose himself to Confederate sniper fire five times in order to triangulate. From his observations, he found the required length by ascertaining the angle from his sighting position to the existing shaft with the use of the theodolite. Once that angle was determined and the distance was known from his sighting to the shaft, he figured the unknown distance to the Confederate line by trigonometry. The shaft had to run 510.8 feet. To address his concern about ventilation, Pleasance used common sense. Most thought the shaft too long for proper ventilation, but the 48th's lieutenant colonel knew warm air rose. So 100 feet from the entrance, still behind the Union picket line, he ran a vertical shaft to the surface. Between that shaft and the entrance, he stretched an airtight canvas door. Then his men took boards and made an 8 inches square air duct and ran it along the floor from the entrance through the airtight opening in the stretched canvas and all the way up to where the men were digging. Then a grating was added, and a fire was built on the far side of the partition from the entrance. Crudely, but effectively, Pleasance created a giant air pump. Warm air rose up the vertical shaft and created low pressure. Cool air was pulled through the entrance via the air duct 
and ran the length of the horizontal shaft. And so work continued. And on Saturday, July 23rd, the mine was finished. Three days later, Burnside submitted his plan for detonation and subsequent infantry attack. His assault would begin with the mines firing at first light. Two brigades and columns would be sent in through the gap created by the blast. One regiment at the head of one column would turn to the left, and a regiment leading the other to the right. Both would clear any Confederates on either flank of the destroyed fort. Then the rest of the division would drive to the top of Cemetery Hill with Burnside's remaining three divisions just behind. While Meade and Grant reviewed Burnside's attack plan, Pleasants received orders to begin loading the tunnel with gunpowder. This was the last major concern for the pre-war civil engineer. At the end of the 510.8-foot shaft, two 40-foot lateral galleries were dug. And on Wednesday afternoon, the 27th, 320 kegs, 8,000 pounds of black powder were placed. Eight magazines were loaded 22 feet directly under the Confederate battery. The four tons of powder were to be detonated by gunpowder-filled troughs, which led back to the main gallery, and from there a 98-foot fuse which ran toward the mine's entrance. To make certain the blast was directed upwards, the magazines were tamped with bags of sand by a detail of 150 men, who also tamped the last 34 feet of the main gallery. For detonation, Pleasants requested high-quality continuous blasting fuse. However, he received low-grade fuse, which came in strips of 10 feet, so his men made splice after splice. In spite of all the obstacles, all was finally ready Thursday evening, the 28th. The next day, Meade issued orders to implement Burnside's plan. It would take place on Saturday, the 30th. To give support, Meade ordered his 5th Corps to concentrate on Burnside's left and the 18th Corps to support Burnside's right. Meade also promised to order his engineers to clear Confederate obstacles, to concentrate his artillery, and to divert Confederate attention, Union cavalry was to hit Confederate lines to the south and west. Meade told Burnside to spring his mine at 3.30 a.m. All seemed settled. Then, with detonation less than 24 hours, Burnside learned that Meade had made last-minute changes to his plan of attack. In Burnside's original plan, Brigadier General Edward Ferrero's division, his freshest, was to lead the attack. They had even rehearsed their spearheading role, but Meade wanted another. You see, Ferrero's men were African-American. In fact, he led the only division of United States colored troops in the Army of the Potomac, and so Meade fretted, as he put it, that we were shoving these people ahead to get killed because we did not care anything about them. Livid, Burnside stressed the importance of his original plan. Meade agreed to take the matter up with Grant. Meanwhile, Burnside continued preparations, but all that came to a screeching halt mid-morning Friday the 29th. Not only did Grant agree that black troops should not be in the forefront, but Meade also ordered there would be no lateral movements to clear enemy trenches. Instead, the entire attacking force was to drive straight ahead, straight through the blasted area and to the crest. Burnside was devastated. You see, he excelled at making plans on paper, and this one had been a good one. But as his record showed, when forced to improvise, he struggled. And that meant, sadly, his men would suffer the consequences. Unwilling to choose which division would now lead, Burnside decided he would have his remaining division commanders, Brigadier Generals Robert Porter, James Ledley, and Orlando Wilcox, draw straws. Ledley lost. 
Despite the fact that Burnside knew him to be the least competent, a known weakling, drinker, and coward, the decision stood. Then, quite honestly, Burnside didn't help Ledley's division when he offered little assistance to clear the way for pushing through the tangle of Confederate obstacles. Meade is accountable as well, for he had promised to help, but nothing ever materialized. And to make things worse, Ledley's men did not receive entrenching tools, should they indeed make it to the crest of the hill as ordered. In short, Ledley's orders were, After detonation, your men should plow straight ahead. Potter's division will follow and bear to the right. Wilcox's division to the left. On the afternoon of the 29th of July, Meade personally visited Burnside's headquarters and stressed the importance of timing. Burnside's men had to exploit the blast and resulting Confederate confusion. They had to reach the crest as quickly as possible. If the attack failed, Meade emphasized the men must be ordered back within the protection of Union lines. By now, the appointed time for detonation was only hours away. It was 3.15 in the morning when a sleep-deprived Henry Pleasance entered the shaft of the tunnel. He lit the fuse and raced out. Now all waited. He figured it would take 15 minutes to burn the 98 feet of fuse. But at 3.30, nothing. Perhaps the fuse went out, or maybe it burned slowly. Pleasance was beside himself. He guessed the spliced fuses had failed. At 4.15, he allowed two volunteers, Sergeant Henry Reese and Lieutenant Jacob Doughty, to enter the tunnel and investigate. They tore away the tamping and indeed found the fuse had gone out at the first of ten splices. They relit it and scrambled for safety. Fourteen minutes later, at 4.44 in the morning of July the 30th, 1864, the very bowels of the earth groaned, jarred like an earthquake, and then rounded, bubbled, and burst. The Confederate fort and hill under the mine lifted, and according to observers, then a monstrous tongue of flame shot fully 200 feet into the air, followed by a vast column of white smoke. Then a great spout or fountain of red earth rose to a great height, mingled with men and guns, timbers and planks, and every kind of debris, all ascending, spreading, whirling, scattering, and falling with great concussion to the earth once more. To amplify the chaos, 110 Federal cannon and 54 mortars immediately opened up along nearly two miles of trench lines. Indeed, as one dazed and terrified, hatless and shoeless Confederate soldier put it, hell is busted. The blast obliterated the tip of Elliott salient. At least 22 gunners of Pigram's battery and flanking the guns, 256 men of the 18th and 22nd South Carolina were dead. Scores of others wounded, many thrown into the air only to fall to earth along with tons of dirt and debris. The way to Petersburg was wide open. Yet, the explosion stunned men in blue almost as much as those in butternut and gray. In fact, some of Ledley's men broke and ran to the rear. Others stood as if paralyzed. Ten minutes or more passed before anyone pulled it together. Then the attackers paid the price for their failure to clear their own breastworks. Hasty steps were made from stacked muskets so men could climb up and out and advance. That effort destroyed formations, and men swept forward in ragged spurts. Clouds of dust and gun smoke choked the air as Colonel Elisha G. Marshall's brigade scrambled toward the smoldering crater. They raced the 100 yards, clambered up a 12-foot-high wall of dirt created by the blast, peered over, and froze at the sight before them. Where Pigram's Redan once sat now yawned an enormous hole. 
180 to 200 feet long, 60 feet wide, and 30 feet deep. It was a chasm filled with smoldering smoke, dust, great blocks of clay, broken gun carriages, projecting timbers and men buried in various ways, some up to their necks, others to their waist, and some with only feet and legs protruding from the earth. Ledley's lead brigade, marshals, stood transfixed until he roared at them to make their way down into the crater. Down into the blasted earth they spilled. Some milled. Some incredibly hunted for souvenirs. And even more incredibly, some stopped to help Confederate wounded. A portion of it made it to the far side and began to form up for the advance to the Jerusalem Plank Road. As they did, many gaze now upon the Confederate works. One described them as a perfect honeycomb of bomb-proofs, trenches, covered ways, sleeping holes, and little alleys running in every direction, and all partially filled with debris from the explosion. And beyond, there was more, more newly constructed trenches and defensive works. Marshall, with great difficulty, got his men into rough battle lines, and they pushed forward, traverse by traverse. Yet by this time, dazed Confederates were stirring. Dusty survivors of the 22nd South Carolina threw up a barricade of sandbags across the main trench south of the breach. And to the north, the 17th South Carolina spread out in the connecting trenches and traverses to contain the Union attackers. At this point, Union forces needed strong leadership. But none came. James Ledley was huddled in a bomb-proof far to the rear with a bottle of rum. And there he sat as the divisions of Potter and Wilcox passed him as they headed to the front. As they did, two Confederate batteries unleashed a devastating crossfire on the slope between the crater and Federal lines. The fire tore into Ledley, Potter, and Wilcox's men. As one Confederate noted, the field looked like an inclined plane of dead men. For Potter's division, like Ledley's, it plunged into Confederate mazes of covered ways, rifle pits, and trenches. Fighting hand-to-hand, disoriented commands mixed. They could only go so far. On the left, Wilcox's men fared similarly. By 7 a.m., some two hours and 16 minutes after detonation, elements of the 10th Corps reached the front, but blocked by the teeming mass of soldiers, they could not advance. Everywhere, disorganized, confused men in blue fought in bands and bunches. One federal officer, Brigadier General John W. Turner, saw Ferrero's black troops appear at the lip of the crater, but wondered, where was Ferrero? He was back in the same bomb-proof with Ledley, while his troops poured over and into the man-made hellhole. So thick they were, a man could not walk. Many were indeed on hands and knees. Three hours after the explosion, there were over 10,000 Union soldiers crammed into the area of the crater. And while they struggled, Confederates organized for a counterattack. Confederate General Elliott had survived the blast, but was wounded in reorganizing his survivors. Colonel Fitzwilliam McMaster took over Elliott's brigade and organized a temporary line across the throat of the blasted salient some 200 yards behind the crater. He posted a second line, even more fragile, 100 yards further to the rear. For three hours, those few were all that lay between the Union Army and Petersburg. By 6 a.m., Lee himself was on the scene, and he ordered 125-pound Major General William Mahone to send two of his brigades north to reinforce a blasted Confederate division at the crater. Of sprightly Mahone, one Union soldier assessed, not much man, but a big general. And another, whenever Mahone moves out, someone is apt to be hurt. Rather than send troops to the threatened area, he went with them, 
and upon reaching Major General Bushrod Johnson's Confederate headquarters, was shocked to see that Confederate division commander sitting down to breakfast and showing little concern for what was going on. Now, Johnson did detail a lieutenant to guide Mahone and his men to the fighting, but then returned to his food. Full of fury, Mahone led his brigades north along the Jerusalem Plank Road, then turned southeast. It was 8.30 in the morning, and they raced into something out of Dante's Inferno. Beyond the lip of the crater, thousands of masked men in blue, white and black, stacked, leaderless, confused. Mahone ordered his men to fix bayonets, and down into the seething cauldron they charged. To those in blue, orders were forwarded from Ferrero, who was still far back of the fighting in the safety of the bomb-proof. He ordered his men to move out of the crater and seize the crest of Cemetery Hill. Incredibly, some 200 tried, but as soon as they came into Confederate sight, Southern artillery raked them. That's when Mahone's avalanche of butternut and gray struck. Isolated and without support, Ferrero's black soldiers were stopped cold. More than these raw soldiers could stand, they broke. And Mahone's men, enraged that there were armed black troops, pursued. Once overrun, some tried to surrender, but incensed Confederates cut them down. Mahone's pursuit now paid dividends, for they ran into yet another Federal column that was trying to force its way forward through the fleeing mass of African-American troops. Mahone's Confederates stacked them up, and they too stampeded. Southern fire down into the crater and from elevated flanks was such that many Union soldiers, when hit, fell and rolled down the steep sides to the bottom, where in places they piled up three and four deep. Meanwhile, more Confederates arrived and pitched in. On the crater's south end, Virginians drove up a traverse and were within 20 yards of the blasted area itself. Staggered, Federals in that sector saw them and furiously began to build breastworks on the north end of the traverse. They stacked up lumps of clay, but it was slow going. Finally, someone shouted, Put in the dead! And so a large number of the slain, white and black, Union and Confederate, were used to fill the trench. In the vortex of fighting, a Pennsylvania captain watched one black soldier climb atop a pile of twenty bodies and fire at the approaching Confederates. So tightly squeezed were the Union soldiers that there was hardly any standing room. So packed, some of those killed were held in a standing position until jostled to the ground. For nearly five hours, Meade, back at Burnside's headquarters with Grant, tried to get information from Burnside, who, to his credit, was at a forward command post. At 6.50 a.m., Meade telegraphed, what is the delay in your column moving? Every minute is most precious. The great point is to secure the crest at once and at all hazards. Burnside answered, I am doing all in my power to push the troops forward, and if possible, we will carry the crest. At 7.30, Meade wired back. What is the obstacle? Do you mean to say your officers and men will not obey your orders to advance? A harried Burnside fired back. I mean to say that it is very hard to advance to the crest, and added, Were it not insubordinate, I would say that latter remark of your note was unofficer-like and ungentlemanly. At 9 a.m., Burnside sent back definitive word, and it was not good. He wrote, Many of the Ninth and Eighteenth Corps are retiring before the enemy. A stunned Meade later reported, This was the first information I had received that there had been any collision with the enemy, or that there was any enemy present. At 9.30, the commander of the Army of the Potomac suggested retiring. Fifteen minutes later, that suggestion became a preemptive order. It was appropriate, for at the front, Repeated Confederate assaults from so many points 
meant that Union soldiers were losing the will to fight. And it didn't help that the day was unbearably hot, canteens were empty. Though Meade had ordered retreat, to do so meant they had to run down into the crater and up a slope which fully exposed them to southern fire from three sides. As one Union lieutenant remembered, nearly every man who attempted it was riddled with bullets. Mahone's two brigades had immobilized three Federal Corps, and it got worse. At 1 p.m., Brigadier General John Sanders' Alabama Brigade arrived and charged. Joined by the 61st North Carolina and 17th South Carolina, they added a new wave of terror of men trying to escape the crater. While some tried to surrender, hand-to-hand fighting continued. In short, the slaughter was fearful. In some places, the dead were piled eight deep. By 2 p.m., it was finally over. Within hours of the blast and attack, Confederates had constructed a new line, and to add insult to injury, it was located in front of the crater. For the fight, the official Union count reported 504 killed, 1,881 wounded, and 1,413 missing for a total of 3,798. Confederate casualties numbered at least 361 killed, 727 wounded, 403 missing for a total of 1,491. At 5 a.m. the next day, Sunday, July 31st, a truce was declared so that armies, both, could collect their wounded and bury their dead. An officer in the 32nd Maine never forgot the scene. He wrote, Men were swollen out of all human shape, and whites could not be told from blacks except by their hair. So many were so swollen that their clothes were burst, and their waistbands could not reach halfway around their bodies, and the stench was awful. Incredibly, a man from New Hampshire remembered the 31st as a beautiful morning, and not a shot was heard all along the line. Officers and men of both armies mingled there while we were caring for the dead are set upon the breastworks on our left and right engaged in friendly conversation. While all the grisly work went on, a Confederate band came up and began to play. A Union band answered, and for two hours the two brass bands played alternately. However, music was not enough to erase the memory of Union men who had fought there, and for that matter, for Union command. The attack on the crater had been a fumbled opportunity from the beginning, and though Grant did little to aid its success, he did order a court of inquiry. Yes, heads would roll. Following his testimony before the official court, Burnside was faulted for failing to form a proper line of battle, for not ordering engineers to clear Confederate obstacles, and for disobedience to Meade's orders. The crestfallen officer soon left the Army on a 20-day furlough. He was never recalled. He resigned from the U.S. Army April 15, 1865. Major General James Ledley who drank rum far behind in a bomb-proof while his division was butchered, was censured, and left the Army on August the 6th on a 20-day sick leave that lasted four months. When he returned in early December, he received orders, quote, to repair to his home and there await orders. None ever came. And so he resigned his commission January 15, 1865. Brigadier General Edward Ferrero was also censured, but incredibly, not only retained his divisional command, but in December received the brevet rank of Major General for meritorious service in the present campaign. And what of the man who conceived the project, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasance? 
Two days after the battle, he was placed in command of the 2nd Brigade of Potter's 2nd Division in the 9th Corps. He was breveted Brigadier General in March of 1865. Even Meade and Grant had to shoulder part of the blame, for although they made decisions, they left far too many details to corps and divisional officers. When the general-in-chief reported the disaster to Washington City, he wired, It was the saddest affair I have witnessed in the war. Such opportunity for carrying fortifications I have never seen and do not expect again to have. And so, after the Battle of the Crater, both armies settled into siege warfare, siege warfare that would span nine more months, nine more months of digging and burrowing into the earth, nine more months of denuded landscapes. For common soldiers, day after day after day, dying from sniper fire, from flying shrapnel, and predominantly from filth and pestilence. The 10-month siege at Petersburg claimed 70,000 Union and Confederate lives. 10 months of living hell that gave us a horrifying glimpse of what would come 50 years down the road. And yet another war, one believed by its generation as the war to end all wars. Sadly, they would be wrong. When next we gather, it will be August of 1862, and we'll return to a site where armies clashed 11 months earlier. Then, it was a fight between amateur armies. This time, between men accustomed to the sound and fury of battle, but with stakes politically diplomatically, militarily, that were quite compelling. I hope you'll join us when we, for the second time, return to Chin Ridge and Henry House Hill, the Battle of Second Manassas. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening. <laughs>